we've got lots of ground to cover today, especially this uh, architecture practice who is led by the (laughs) anti-architect. So that's complicated to say the least. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Hey there, sunshine. Today's episode is brought to you by The Perfect Match, a game where designers submit mood boards created with Adobe stock assets and earn the chance to play on a fab game show to win big. As designers, we pitch good vibes and great ideas through visuals all day, every day. But how well does our design communicate? Do clients and higher-ups really understand the work we put in front of them? Well, let's find out. Test your mad skills by assembling a brand-inspired mood board with Adobe stock images to the perfect match. And if your skillful project is chosen, you'll be featured on Adobe's monthly live streaming game show with other groovy designers, art directors, and creatives, where the winner goes home with $750. It's free to participate in the perfect match. Submit an entry and Adobe will buy you coffee for your time. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and bring your design skills to win big. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm excited to chat with the president and co-owner of the New York City Tech First Architecture and Design Firm, Mancini Duffy, Christian Giordano, and co-owner and design principal, Jessica Man Amato. Christian has dubbed himself and his podcast as the anti-architect, and I'm excited to dig into that statement alone, let alone learn more about this 105-year-old firm. Drawing inspiration from some of the tech forward companies Mancini works with, like Peloton, Disney, and Soho House, Christian and Jessica focus on technologies that propel the world of design forward. Mancini launched the Design Lab, which brings together designers, technologists, and clients to leverage VR, 3D printing, drones, generative design, and AI to break barriers, limiting traditional design capabilities. I'm excited to chat with them about how they recalibrated and modernized Mancini, sparking industry-wide change. We're going to talk about infusing technology into all facets of the design process, creation of their software, the tool belt, and its impact on the industry, and the future of workplace design. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Christian and Jessica. Okay, kids, all the way from New York City, please welcome Christian Giordano and Jessica Man Amato. Christian and Jessica, welcome to Obsessed Show. Thanks, Thanks Josh. Thanks for having us. Well, it's awesome to have you guys here. I am. Uh, we've got lots of ground to cover today, especially this uh, architecture practice who is led by the anti-architect. <laughs> So that's complicated to say the least. Um, but maybe we can jump off where I tend to with most of our interviews. I'm curious to hear your origin stories and maybe, maybe Christian, what led you to become the anti-architect? Um, but uh, <laughs> Christian and Jessica, tell us about your backgrounds. Sure. Jessica, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, so I actually grew up in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, I am the granddaughter of a bunch of creatives. My grandma's a portrait artist. My other grandma was a uh, closet uh, decorator. Uh, my grandfather was a structural engineer. So I kind of come at the creative and the analytical naturally um, through my family. I've always known I wanted to be an interior designer. I was a kid who was kind of, you know, shifting all the furniture around and rearranging the art in the house at age seven. So we always sort of knew that's what I would do. So I pursued it with a vision, um, literally from high school. Um, I asked my teachers to help me to create a portfolio to get into Ringling School of Art and Design. Um, I got into Ringling, uh, amazing fighter accredited school in Sarasota, Florida. Um, made some great connections during my time there that kind of led me to New York. Um, And in New York, I've worked my way through some amazing design and architecture firms and kind of worked my way up in the industry. Um, And part of that being uh, very involved in the IIDA New York chapter as well. Um, And then, you know, Christian and I met uh, many years ago at a firm, Conant Architects, that we worked at. We've stayed in touch for a very long time. 
And uh, I joined the firm uh, two and a half years ago and became a shareholder in January of 2019. So it's been a it's been a great journey to get here, and uh, we're doing some amazing things at Mancini. Very cool, Christian. I'll let you uh, jump in here. Yeah, and so for me, um, same thing. I mean, I always wanted to be an architect uh, for as long as I could remember. I think before that, it was I wanted to be a farmer, you know, and then uh, quickly wanted to be an architect and just pursued that all the way through and. Uh, Kind of had that focus in high school, and I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, I went to the University of Miami in Florida for my undergraduate degree in architecture, and then I went to UCLA in California uh, for my graduate degree. And uh, it was there I, you know, worked with uh, Frank Gehry and for our Tom Main and Morphosis, and um, eventually kind of knew I wanted to make my way back to New York. And I called up a firm named Swanky Hayden Connell and asked them if I could come and work for them because I had done some internships with them uh, in, when I was in Miami. And they were kind enough to pretend that they remembered who I was. And they said, sure, come on in. And I got a job uh, in New York City. And from there, uh, just like Jessica, you know, kind of uh, moved to a couple of different firms. I uh, went to HLW International for a, a, a long period of time. And then this opportunity uh, at Mancini now going on about eight plus years ago, might even be more than that, um, came about to move over to Mancini and begin this reinvention of this 100-year-old architecture firm. And, and here we are, brought people like Jessica over and uh, many others, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a fun run. Well, before we get too far away from this, um, I'm curious the farming connection. Like, do you do you see that tying into what you do in architecture, or what that dual inspiration was about? Uh, who knows? I just always thought, um, for whatever reason, uh, sort of that connection back to nature and architecture, and for some reason, it it just kind of pulled together. I do like the outdoors and and that kind of thing, but the you know, the city environment and really is what you know kind of propelled me into the more of the, the architecture side of things. Well, maybe along the lines of that propelling into the architecture side, uh, I got to imagine introduction to Frank Gehry early in your career uh, was a pivotal element. Uh, what, what do you feel like is stuck with you most about that relationship? So I would say what definitely stuck uh, of that was that he was, he is um, a very kind and gentle man. And, um, you know, it, it, people in the firm worked really hard. I mean, listen, I was an intern there. I barely had anything to do uh, other than work at that point. But, but people there really, in in a weird way, for such a for a a, um, a black cape, you know, superstar architect, actually had a had a life a, a work life balance. And I think of all the things I took from that, other than the fact that he was very involved with every single project. Um, is that, oh, you could actually be a superstar architect and still maintain an, a life, um, which was very different or anti what I had seen in, um, in a lot of the firms that I worked through uh, as I kind of worked up my, through my career. You used that word anti there. <laughs> Maybe you're planting a seed with your farming background, but... Uh... Well, I realized I didn't answer that question before, so I figured I better, uh, I better get that out of the better, way. Better touch that base. <laughs> Tell us, what in, the, what in the world does that mean? I mean, I, obviously, it's the title of your podcast, and it's, and it's something you've carried through here. What Tell us about the inspiration for that title. I mean, listen, it... it, it as far as being the anti-architect goes, I don't, I don't really know about that. It's kind of funny that people are now saying that about me, which is, which is kind of funny. I mean, the reality <laughs> is that I, I think, you know, I don't quite fit into the profession uh, the same way as many do. And I, but I also don't want to say like, oh, I'm the only outlier of the profession because that's certainly not true at all either. Definitely a lot of people see it the way I see it. The anti-architect podcast came about as, well, maybe we could be a critical voice of the profession itself, right? Uh, and look at it from a different point of view and get some other perspectives and uh, interesting guests that through shared experiences or through um, 
sort of critical thinking, they could actually have some criticism of our profession that could thus make it a better profession by we can learn from all of these different scenarios that people have have spoken about. And I think so far, there are some amazing themes that have emerged. You know, what do architects do well? What do they not do well? Um, what, what, why are architects annoying in certain circumstances, but not in others? Um, how do we work well with interior designers or not work well with them and why is that? What does the education of an architect or an interior designer kind of bring to the table versus other educations? And I think those questions and answers are beginning to unfold and there's a narrative there that I'm just starting to to tell. And I'm excited to kind of see where that goes, uh, you know, in the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Jessica, tell us a little bit more about what Mancini Duffy does and give us a rundown of the types of clients that you guys work with. So we're really lucky to be very diversified and work with a lot of different clients and market sectors. You know, we do everything from workplace strategy to architectural interiors, to base building, to master planning, um, you know, furniture coordination, uh, branding, all of the above. Um, and we're highly diversified throughout all the market sectors. So for instance, on my plate right now, I have a, a large workplace interior, three different restaurant brands, um, working with uh, some advertising agencies, um, working on a um, gaming company, e-gaming e company, which is really interesting um, in an industry that is blowing up right now. Um, and so we, we're just very diversified in all of the different types of things that, that we're touching on a day-to-day -day basis um, and in many different market sectors, which is great. Christian, I'll direct this one to you, but uh, feel free to jump in here. Otherwise, Jessica, um, you know, we, we rattled off some some big client names and, and you shared a few more there. What does it take to land clients like a, a Disney or a Peloton? Like what what makes you guys different or what has suited you well to, to bring on some of those big names? Well, Peloton's a little bit of cheating because my cousin <laughs> is actually the co-founder of Peloton. So that one kind of doesn't count, um, <laughs> which is kind of funny and, and, and good for him. So that's kind of how we got into there. But the rest, unless there's some crazy family connection like that, honestly, it's a combination of we, we've got a very known uh, name in New York City which I think uh, helps us kind of get to the table initially. People trust the name Mancini Duffy. It's a well-known New York City institution as far as design goes. And then the rest is really hard work. I mean, it's myself, it's Jessica, it's several of the other partners and principals that are literally, you know, whether it's out there, you know, kind of pounding the pavement and looking for opportunities. Um, but for us, it's all relationships. I mean, we are not we're not a super RFP heavy kind of firm, meaning that, you know, we're, you know, yes, we get RFPs and sometimes they're unsolicited because of that great name. But most of the time it's because people know us and they trust us. We also have played the long game. Um, I know myself and Jessica have and, and many of the other partners, you know, we're in this for the next 20 to 30 years together. And so by starting small with people and, and developing real relationships, not just sort of networking events or, you know, whatever those, you know, the going to seminars and things like that, um, but actual real relationships where the clients, the brokers, the developers, the, you know, even the other, even other, you know, uh, professions like the, you um, uh, some of the some of the rep groups or furniture dealers or lawyers, you know, they become actual friends, and then from there they help us either maybe an introduction to someone that has a project, or you know, maybe they have a project, or in ten years they may have a project. And kind of here we are, and and it's not as though we're we're not project seekers; we're really re, you know relationship seekers. I think a key point to that too, something that Christian said is partners. You know, it's really about the way that we partner with our clients and they become an integral part of our team. And that creates, you know, return clients. And it also, I think a lot of times is why we win projects because we're very open and honest about our process of design and our because of the way that we immerse our clients into that and because they become true partners, it's enticing for people. Yeah. Yeah, that that's refreshing to hear. Especially I've uh, worked for and worked around 
a lot of folks in the architecture, engineering, construction world. And I know RFPs are just sort of like, it's just how it is. <laughs> like almost everybody is competing over this, you know, giant PDF or big stack of paper. Um, and I think it's really refreshing to hear somebody leading in the architecture and design space to say, look, we're just going to do this, the, the relationship route. And, you know, bottom line is people work with who they like, know, and trust anyhow. So that, <laughs> that RFP exactly. often translates to who's got the relationship anyhow. And RFP is just sort of a hoop you have to go through. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's really refreshing. Um, so speaking of your firm, I, I have to imagine Christian, at some point you may have calculated, okay, do I just go start my own thing? Do I go hang out my own shingle? You chose to uh, sort of reinvigorate a hundred year old plus firm instead. Um, tell us about that thought process and like, and why, like, why breathe new life into the firm as opposed to starting fresh? Yeah. So I definitely thought about going out on my own a hundred percent and really simultaneously with the thought of coming to Mancini Duffy to reinvent it. And, you know, I was working at HLW International. I loved working there, big firm. I worked on really high profile, you know, large projects, not only in the U.S., but also in China and Dubai and, you know, very exciting stuff architecturally and, um, you know, just a big kind of dynamic place. And I, I, you know, worked my way up there. I was running the departments and you know, running the, you know, the design groups in both China and New York. And, you know, I kind of, in a weird way though, I was bored, right. I was looking for the next step while I was always busy. I was looking to see, well, what was next for me? And, and, and listen, I've, I've told this before. I, I kind of had my own little firm going in a sense, right. I did a lot of freelance work when I was there, I was doing apartments and um, I mean, pretty large stuff for, for like a one man show. And I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe this is it. Maybe I do need to step out and do my own thing along the, Along the way, the Mancini opportunity came about where uh, Ralph Mancini actually was looking for, he had already retired in, in the early 2000s, um, but he's kept in touch with the firm. And, and he, when, when I was approached by him, he said, listen, I'm looking for someone young um, that isn't 40 yet. I wasn't 40 at the time. Uh, and, you know, to come in and kind of reinvent this hundred year old architecture firm. And I thought, okay, well, that's kind of cool. I know Mancini Duffy. I know they're, they're pretty established. Maybe I could kind of do both, right? I could kind of have my own firm, but start on second base so that I'm not doing the, uh, you know, the apartment renovations that I was doing because I do love, large projects and, you know, whether it's large corporate interior projects or um, sort of the big names that you mentioned, the big clients or big developments, um, you know, the idea of kind of starting small, I, I like, I like the idea of fast forwarding kind of to the, you know, the halfway point. And that's ultimately what we did. Um, and then Jessica can, can speak to reinventing it, but it's really a, it's, it's a small, like kind of one step at a time process, bringing new people in and getting better projects and clients and right, Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, when I joined the firm for me, it was really about this idea of having a group of partners that we can all depend on each other. You know, we have our, we all have our own responsibilities, but at the end of the day, we all have each other's backs and we're all looking to propel the firm forward. And this idea of reinventing things through technology is something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts. So looking at ways to, um, you know, reinvent procedures and policies and, and institutions, even of the way that things have been done in the architecture and design industry for hundreds of years. And how can we gain efficiencies and at the same time gain better creativity throughout the reinvention of this process? So um, I think that's sort of the connecting thread for, for all of us here in the partnership at Mancini. So um, that, that kind of leads into our, our tool belt. Um, and Kristen, I don't know if you want to start off and 
Yeah, so so part of reinventing the firm was, you know, as Jessica said, was you know, not only the people side of things and the client side of things, but really also the design process, right? And if I'm coming at it from this idea that we want to be different and not just different for the sake of being different, but we want to we want to treat everyone that works at the firm a certain way, and we do want to have that work life balance, um, but we also want to reinvent the process in which we do design, and we do need to make it more efficient because. Because today, you know, I haven't started a pro- I will say I have not started a project in the last, I would say, five years, it might even be more than that, where on the kickoff meeting, the first thing out of the client's mouth is that we're already behind schedule. You know, so everything is behind schedule. Everything is due right away. You know, you used to get, you know, eight weeks for a schematic design and 10 weeks for, you know, DD. And now you're looking at two weeks of schematic design. And it's like somehow you've got to produce the same quality of work and you've got to get it all done uh, in a much, much shorter period of time. And for whatever reasons there are for that, there are. And I think we've kind of accepted it. And instead of, you know, throwing our hands up and saying we can't deliver on the quality, we took a stab at a a technology way of designing. And so what we do is, you know, we we have a patent pending piece of software called the tool belt. and, And that is really a virtual reality rendering engine where we're taking the way our our designers are working, whether that's in Rhino or Revit or whatever software, and we're automatically creating a VR experience for the client. Um, Essentially at at the click of a button without really the designer having to do much work. It's really the programmers and the developers that have developed the software for us that are all in house, that are all, you know, educated as designers or architects. And they're able to, um, get this process rolling where the designer is designing and the client in real time is actually inside their space, whether that's like this on a Zoom meeting. We adapted it for COVID so you didn't have to come in and do real VR. Or the ideal is that you do come in and you use the VR. Uh, and that has really changed the way that we um, we deliver our projects and our process. And it's become uh, a completely interactive way of working with the client. The client kind of sees the down and dirty of what we're doing um, and they react to it, right? And because there's no time to tell them, hey, we'll be back to you in two weeks with five other options. And then from there, we'll be back to you in two weeks with three new options and so on and so forth. We're never going to get anywhere. So how can we quickly hone in on what the the client is looking for or what we as designers are trying to express, right? Because in the end, you know, it isn't only about agreeing, having the client agree with it. It's about kind of steering a client to the right design solution that we think is right and the reason why they hired us. And, and that's kind of the beauty of it, it, it that Christian alluded to is that we're, we're almost letting you behind the curtain in Oz, right? We're letting you be a part of the process from start to finish instead of, you know, creating something, showing it to you, going back behind the scenes, recreating it, showing it to you again. We're, we're letting you behind the scenes. So you're literally with us and seeing everything we're doing from start to finish. So whether it's in our VR arena here in the office or whether we're doing it, you know, as a, a multiplayer within our tool belt environment where everyone is immersed in the environment from wherever you are in the world and we're walking around in it together, it's um it's an immersive process. So from initial test fit, when we're looking at different real estate opportunities and doing initial space planning layouts, um, we're able to walk you through a black and white 3D environment. And then as we start looking at conceptual design, what that architectural envelope starts to look like, how the big ideas start to develop in the space. And then as we start to layer in, you know, furniture and finishes and lighting and all of that, as we go through schematic design and design development, all of that comes alive within this immersive environment. So we can very quickly get buy-in from everyone on the client side. We can tell our story in a way that they can very easily easily visualize the the design story and the big ideas that we're we're trying to tell, and we're able to come to a conclusion quickly that allows us to kind of strip away some of the time within the schedule. Well, maybe do a little a little inside baseball. I know one of the challenges in the architecture and engineering world around sort of modernizing and getting into software 
design is is figuring out where the handoff is and liability and all that stuff like okay so where where does the hvac go and where does water go and where does power go and do you have this built in here and you know christian i listened to a couple of your episodes ago where you're kind of discussing some of these issues i'm curious if tool tool belt is attempting to solve any of those elements of the design process as well or if this is more of just of how we quickly iterate with the client no it definitely you know if the if the consultants, and that is always the preferred method, are working in Revit, then it's going to bring in their work as well. And so you're going to get a complete picture from the design side of things. Now, from the functionality side of things, we've got to kind of trust that it's going to work in the way that they're designing it. But from an aesthetic point of view or a function or, or a, a design function point of view, it's all there. And the more, the more the merrier, right? The more we can feed into that in terms of real world modeling information whether that's manufacturers, you know, furniture, like we have buttons on the tool belt that have Herman Miller's furniture and steel cases furniture. And if we can get, you know, the, the AVIT components and the lighting components, so we can get them all in there. The beauty of tool belt is that it's going to bring them all with it. Right. Mm. And everybody then has the ability to manipulate those environments and all of the component parts that are there. So there's no lying. There's no pretending that, well, don't look at that part. It's not really correct. It, it, it is what it, the model says it is. There's no in between. The yeah. other part of that is, you know, because it really is a true collaborative teamwork environment and that we are immersing the clients in it so early, all the consultants are typically brought on very early because we need to integrate everything into the designs that we're showcasing to the client. So it allows for that collaboration to happen much faster than I think a typical process normally would, where sometimes they're not brought in until you know design development phase. Um, it allows them to be brought in quicker because they have to be, because the client's immersed into to their designs as well. Yeah, I, I think it's brilliant. I, you mentioned um, patent pending. So does, does this imply you're going to launch this as a product for other firms to use or other firms <laughs> beta testing this yet? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so definitely in terms of beta testing, we, we, you know, it's, it's available for beta testing free of charge. We want as many people's feedback as possible. Uh, and yeah, because it's recently patent pending, we're trying to figure out what that means for us in terms of the ability to kind of sell it as a as a software, right? Um, so that's kind of our 2022 goals uh, going forward. Yeah, I've seen other firms, I mean, kind of famously, many people may be familiar with the product base camp started out as a, as a tool, those guys created to run web design projects better. And, you know, now they're <laughs> breaking in millions because they just do base camp. Yep. Um, yeah. So figuring that, that challenge, like if you do launch it and it is successful, then, then who's going to run that thing? So <laughs> We got a guy. <laughs> you got a guy. That's a good start. <laughs> well, um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, I I can imagine both of you wear lots of hats any given week, any given day. Uh, to, but tell us a little bit about what what your role might look like on a typical week, like some of the duties that each of you take on, and and what it looks like in each of your particular seats. So um, my typical kind of work week is probably spending about 50% of the time kind of collaborating with teams, overseeing design, big design concepts, um, keeping the designs on track, making sure that we're delivering to the clients. Um, and then probably 25% of the time is the actual design presentation for all the different types of projects that we're involved in. And then the rest of the time, there's a lot of kind of back of house, um, you know, business, uh, paperwork, busy work, um, and coordination with all the different types of um, consultants and, and vendors that we work with. Yeah, listen, for me, there's not enough hours in the day or night or anything uh, to kind of even tell you exactly what I spend my time on. Um, I mean, that my I, I kind of consider my main job um, of the firm is really on the strategy side, you know, kind of making sure that, you know, this is, you know, the goals of what we're setting out to do. And are we, are we on point with those goals? Um, but, but my main job day to day is really 
client relations and trying to develop more relationships or continuing existing relationships, seeking out, you know, what projects are are there for us potentially. And, you know, that takes the whole day when it, by the time it's all said and done, it's a lot of emails, it's a lot of phone calls, it's a lot of meetings. Um, uh, you know, we've gotten very busy um, towards the end of last year. Uh, you know, we we kind of made it through the pandemic, um, busy the entire time, thankfully. But really, the last six months have been extremely busy for us. And uh, with that, I've actually gotten to jump back in and do some design work, which has been kind of nice because we don't have enough designers uh, to go around. So I'm spending some time actually designing some base building work. And it's kind of nice to get in there. And rather than being the participant on the phone call, you know, now I'm I'm leading some of the meetings, which is kind of nice. Going back to my roots of how things used to work, so you know, I'm trying to find a nice balance with uh, sort of day to day client stuff, the actual design work, and then as Jessica said, there's a business side of of the firm that you know we spend um, a good portion of as a as a leadership group and an ownership group, you know, making sure from a from a business point of view that things are you know money's coming in and money's going out. And not only the business side of it, but also employee development. You know, we really believe in this idea of being entrepreneurial and and developing our employees along the career path that they define and helping them to make sure that they are able to continue to push forward in the direction of the career that they want to. We've had some amazing endeavors which have grown out of that, like the design lab, like MDLX, which is the division of our company that does final layer staging and styling. And so it's very important for us as a leadership group to be able to focus on our employees and give them the time that they deserve as well. Um, I'm curious, and I'd like to hear from both of you on this, at this point in your careers, if there's anything you look back to as is a proudest professional moment so far. Um, I think for me, it was when I was IIDA New York chapter president in uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, There was a couple of things about that that really sort of stood out to me. Um, One was it was the culmination of many, many years of volunteerism and being extremely involved in the industry um, while maintaining a more than full-time job um, at the multiple firms that I've worked at. But also it was that we were in the middle of a recession, you know, coming, starting to come out of a recession. uh, But really the way that our industry kind of banded together and that we were able to still put on 53 industry events that year and get all of our committees kind of banded together to come out of this recession and and not focus on the negativity that was going on, but to focus on the positivity and to really lift up the industry. I think that was really a defining moment in my career. Very nice. Christian, what would, what would you put in that category? Yeah, so I thought about this, you know, um, it's really the past two years uh, since the pa- the pandemic started. I-, I think that's what I'm I'm most proud of, kind of looking back. Uh, you know, when the pandemic started, we were, you know, at the beginning of 2019, we were probably, you know, on pace to, as far as revenue goes um, and to the amount of employees that we have, it was going to be the biggest year, you know, that we ever would have had. And, and within, you know, it seemed like minutes, you know, we were weren't going to the office and we were working from home and we were in the middle of the shutdown and it was total panic mode. And I didn't really know, listen, none of us had led through that time. And it was very, very nerve wracking. Um, And kind of looking back, I think we treated it um, just like we treated rebuilding the firm, sort of, you know, small victories at a time, right? The fact that, you know, oh, clients are still going to pay us, right? So therefore, we're still going to be able to make payroll and uh, working from home actually does work. Uh, it may not work how we how we expected, but it's going to be okay. And the communication with the firm, and we're a big, we're a big firm in terms of culture. We, we love we love being together. We do a lot of events and dinners and drinks and parties. And that's just kind of our culture. We eat lunch together a lot. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing around the, you know, being in the office is an important thing. And that was stripped away yet. We found a way of maintaining that through the entire pandemic. 
Um, and, and in a strange way, we've grown stronger through it. And listen, people have changed and there's been people that have left during the, you know, post pandemic. And there's a lot of career changes that people are going through. Um, but then we've also brought in new people along the way and new life and new initiatives and new business goals. And I'm, I'm just, I'm really proud that, you know, we as a ownership group and the principals of the firm kind of held it together. We led and we were positive through the entire thing. I mean, never did we look back and go, oh my God, we're so screwed. You know, it was always, nope, this is what's happened and this is how we're going to solve it. And this is what we're going to do to grow. And hey, maybe we're, you know, this is our time to shine as opposed to this is our time to, to, to not, right? So it's been, uh, it's been scary yet a good period of growth. Yeah, I'd like to add to that for a minute. I do think that there was definitely a defining moment to that as well. And the the tool belt software that we've worked so hard to develop and seeing that pivot from being an in-person installation in our design lab to being able to be completely virtual. And I'll never forget being on a presentation with a client where literally everyone was all over the world. And we presented and we were able to extremely successfully sell our design in the same way that we would have if we were in person in the lab. And it was just a defining moment, I think, that this software really works. This is a great piece of software that we need to put out there for the industry. And we need to continue to push this. I think it really kind of solidified that in all of our minds that um, we had achieved our goal of changing the process. I don't think we touched on this when you were talking about tool belt before. Was this something that was in process that you were planning and designing before the pandemic hit? Or is this something that started afterwards? Yeah, no, it started about a year before that, um, but it was purely a VR system. Mm. And we had hired a series of developers that were already working uh, in the lab. Um, and what's great about the developers is that they also participate in the actual project meetings. So they're not just sort of computer tech people sitting in a room somewhere. They're involved in the meetings. They're involved. If, you know, if this was a, a tool belt meeting here, you know, we'd have a, a the developer would would be on screen as well. And they're they're constantly kind of in that feedback loop, trying to make make the software better or technically trying to help us as we go through or whatever glitches there might be. They're there to to solve all of that. Um. That, that's really cool and really great timing <laughs> that that project was already in the works beforehand because I got to imagine it would have been tough to get that up from zero during the pandemic. Especially. Yeah. Um, shifting gears a little bit, Christian, um, who would you list as maybe some of your design heroes coming up in the biz or even folks you look up to now? Um, design heroes, uh, you know, I have a lot of kind of design or, you know, architects and designers that I admire, um, that I think, um, obviously do beautiful work. Gary, um, this guy, Greg Lynn, who is a professor of mine at, uh, UCLA who does amazing work. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of heroes, uh, you know, as cheese ball as it may be, you know, I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan being a Jersey guy. I'm sure some people are going to puke. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I think, you know, aside from the music, what I always, the, the thing about Bruce Springsteen, you know, he's from my hometown, you know, here's a guy who had a, a worldly global impact sort of, you know, from this little Jersey town that kind of made this impact on the world. And I think that that kind of, growing up was like, oh, look, this guy from our hometown did, you know, did all these things, you know, hey, it's possible anyone from this town can do that kind of thing. So I think that's kind of the the poetic side of, of why I like uh, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Jessica, who's on your list? Um, no, necessarily from a design um, perspective, because there's so many, and I feel like I get inspired by by everyone and everything I read and so many of my peers, but um, definitely a few strong women leaders throughout my career, you know, from college, um, Ruth Beals was a professor that I had that really pushed all of us to think about things in a different way and to get involved in our industry. And so she's had a lasting impact on me. Um, Hilda Longinati at one of my first jobs, she's really the person who's kind of credited with starting the um, architecture and design representative within um, Herman Miller. 
Um, and so she kind of taught me that, you know, we all have our place in this industry and we all depend on each other. And if we're not all working together, um, then, you know, parts of it will sort of fall apart. So she taught me to respect everyone's uh, role and place within the, the design process. Um, and then, you know, many people throughout my career and the different firms that I've worked with, Peter Conant was always a big one for me because Peter, I think, um, encouraged the young designers to really get involved in the process. And he was a, a great mentor. Um, and then for me, it's really a lot about uh, looking for inspiration. So there's a lot of artists that I get very inspired by, you know, James Terrell, Nick Cave, um, Donald Judd, you know, and always sort of looking at the world around you and, and art around you and getting inspired to come up with original concepts and designs based on that kind of inspiration. Yeah, good stuff. Um, as as the two of you may be well aware, the title of the show is Obsessed Joe. And kind of the, the premise is that we as creatives tend to, we tend to get a little obsessive about things and we find things that we fixate on for a little bit and we're on to the next thing. Or sometimes we pursue a particular obsession like through our whole career. And I'm I'm curious for each of you, what it is that you find that you are most obsessed with right now? <laughs> for for me, um, it's sort of related. It's definitely related to architecture and design, but it's not necessarily related to what we do at all. Ironically, as I'm obsessed, and I think Jessica knows this, with um, s- urban city dwellers that, um, particularly millennials, uh, that that live in places like New York City or Brooklyn. And when they, and they have a certain design aesthetic when they live there, they like a certain level of modernness or um, sleek design or chic restaurants and that kind of thing. And then when they transition to the suburbs, like they inevitably do, even though they don't think they would, and I think the pandemic has definitely shifted a lot of people towards the suburbs, they, uh, their design aesthetic switches to this sort of very, let's call it pedestrian design where, um, you know, large overscaled furniture inside a split level colonial is kind of the, uh, the default for, for them. And I'm not talking about, you know, obviously budget plays into things, but even those that, that have a big budget, you know, their, their design sensibilities change something from the, from the urban to the suburban. And I'm obsessed as to why and why the suburban, areas that are around these surrounding cities don't ever modernize uh, to a more modern aesthetic uh, when I believe that they actually could. That's really interesting. I I feel like we could talk about that for a long time Um, and we won't because we're running out of time. (laughs) However, just the the whole idea of like the product, if you will, that's available by neighborhoods and builders and, and yes. in that world. Um, yes. Why does it switch? Yeah. We may have to have a part two just to talk about that. All right, that. cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jessica, there's, what's your current obsession? Yeah, there's a couple that it's always changing, as you know. <laughs> um, lately, it's this idea of flexibility and creating longevity in our designs through a truly flexible environment. So it's it's really a lot of research into kind of new technologies like wireless power is one of them that I'm really harping on right now Um, in order to be able to create an architectural envelope that allows you to have completely flexible interior components. Um, And a lot of it sort of goes to this idea of being able to reuse things and for them to have a longer life cycle than they currently do. So, you know, we we design a lot of interiors and m- many times it's for, you know, a five to up to 20 year lease, let's say. But if they're turning over every five years and you think about a lot of the product that's ending up in a landfill and not necessarily getting reused because it was designed for a specific purpose, that's something that weighs on me. So, we're focusing a lot on this idea of how to literally make the space truly flexible by designing a flexible architectural envelope and then being able to have the interior components be flexible as well. And how to still create those moments of high design within those spaces that don't necessarily have to be a solid built environment. 
that can't flex as your space grows over time. It's really come more to the forefront, I think, um, through the pandemic and through clients wanting to reduce their footprint, their real estate footprint, but have it work harder for them. And so we're working with a lot of our long-term clients now to really look at how, how does that space evolve? How does it work now for the lessons that we've learned you know, over the last two years? How does it work for what we'll learn over the next two years as we're moving into these hybrid environments, understanding how they're working and not working for us, and then allowing us to, to flex that environment to work for the current needs? Yeah, if anything, the last two years have shown us <laughs> we don't know what to expect. Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> flexibility, that, that's a good one. Um, and so I'm curious, this could be like a strategic answer that you guys have decided for the firm is kind of a next step. But, you know, with a hundred plus year old firm and a, you know, a list of clients, are there any dream projects or things that Mancini Duffy is interested in pursuing in the future that you guys haven't really gotten into before? Christian has a good one that we talk about a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think one of them, I assume, is what you're talking about, Jessica, is the, you know, it's kind of delivering, you know, we put all this effort into um, creating these 3D models, whether it's in Revit or through our software or whatever, and then we flatten them out, we print them out with pieces of paper, and we give them to a contractor, and we tell them, here, build this, you know, so one of our larger goals is to deliver that 3D model as the final, you know, set of construction documents or instruction manual um, to get a project built. So really, that's a goal that we had set out um, for a five-year plan. Uh, and I think, you know, each year we, we begin to chip away at it uh, and try to you know, develop an actual set of drawings that doesn't need to be submitted you know, as a set of drawings that can be submitted as a, as a 3D model. So I think that's a bigger overarching goal that we've set. We have lots of other little goals, you know, building our own drones, building our own scanning devices. Uh, we even, we even designed a lawnmower app that we, uh, we had a great idea about how to, you know, get self-driving lawnmowers. It turns out someone already invented that, but we were excited about it. So you never know. It's always, we got all sorts of ideas of uh, things that we want to do. 3D printing houses, 3D printing full interior environments. Um, yeah. We're looking at 3D printing product lines, you know, to go along with MDLX and the final layer staging and styling. You know, we've, of course, like everyone else, have run into sourcing issues in the last two years. So, um, you know, it'd be great if we can design a product line, print it in our micro lab, and then it's readily available for whatever we need. So that's one of the initiatives that we're looking at. Yeah, we are 3D printing some of the light fixtures in our new office. We're relocating our, our corporate headquarters uh, in New York City, and we're 3D printing some of the light fixtures there, but as you know, real substantial pieces of art. Nice. Love it. Yeah. Well, hey, we're we're almost at the end of the show here. I wanted to maybe end with this uh, question of this could be either your favorite piece of advice that you've received or favorite piece to pass along. Or alternatively, if you have like a, a challenge or an ask for the audience. So so there's your options. Favorite piece of advice you've received, favorite piece to pass along or, or a challenge for the audience. If you want to do all three, go for it. <laughs> Um, well, some mine are kind of simple. Uh, the first one is to remember to breathe. Uh, I think we all get so wrapped up in what we're doing every day that you sometimes forget to take that moment to breathe. But taking that moment to breathe, I think, allows all of us to refocus and then makes us better at honing in on what we're looking at. Um, and then I think as our CFO Bola would say, you know, it's build boldly, boldly. Building boldly and the power to say yes, um, being open to saying yes, I think um, is something that we really work on here. Um, a lot of our initiatives have come out of um, not being afraid to say yes. So encouraging those crazy ideas that we were just talking about and saying yes to putting the money into R&D. So I think it really kind of comes back to, uh, as Bola would say, building boldly towards your dreams. Yeah, I love it. And I got yeah, a, well, so. uh, a copy of that, that yeah. from your <laughs> team. So I'm excited to to dig into that. Nice. 
Yeah. And listen, for me, um, I don't know if I'm just built this way, but it's, it's being positive. I mean, I, I really, and I'm not this, you know, the power of positive thinking kind of guy. <laughs> That's not really me at all. Um, but I am always positive. And I think over the last couple of years through this pandemic, being positive has really led us to a place where, you know, I'm not worried about kind of the future at all uh, anymore. I know that, you know, we've made it through this far because we've been positive the entire time. Everywhere I go, there's always opportunities that we can find in whatever we're doing. And it's really that that is propelling us into the future. And, you know, I'm excited to kind of see where where we end up because it's going to be a lot of fun. There's something about that positivity also that's infectious and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. And we all really try to embody that here. Um, You never know what connection your next job will come from. And as a great example, uh, my dentist uh, hears me talk about my job all the time and how much I love my job and I love our industry and what we do. And my dentist has a friend who's looking to do a very large development and recommended me. And so we'll be doing this amazing development. And it's all coming from the power of positivity and talking about how much I love what we do. So (laughs) there really is a power in that. (laughs) That is definitely not your typical networking event. No. (laughs) Uh, Well, you've got somebody's utensils in your mouth, clean your teeth. (laughs) It's hard to talk to your dentist too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, hey, before we get completely sidetracked, I appreciate you both for being on the show. Before we uh, head out, tell everybody listening where they can learn more about Mancini, uh, hook up with the two of you online, and then also uh, more about the Anti Architect podcast. Through our website, mancini.duffy.com, um, through our Instagram accounts, obviously, and uh, LinkedIn accounts is probably the best place to find both of us. Yeah, agreed. Definitely the Mancini uh, website kind of links to everything. Uh, there is an antiarchitectpodcast.com coming soon. Or I think it's antiarchitect.com. Uh, it may or may not be up and running fully, but you know that podcast is on Spotify and Apple and all of those uh, channels. And then on my Instagram, which is just Christian D. Giordano, uh, and my LinkedIn as well, it's kind of links to everything uh, all there. Well, Christian and Jessica, thanks so much for uh, being on the show today. It's been great chatting with you guys. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a lot of fun. Hour flew by. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's been great. (laughs) You bet. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode 169 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Thanks again to The Perfect Match for sponsoring today's episode. Visit theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed to learn more and bring your design skills to win big. That's theperfectmatch.co slash obsessed. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.